ten wieczór. Witam wszystkich. Ja po prostu powiem tak, że poproszę, żeby wyłączyć telefony. A nasza gościa zapowiada mi już po angielsku, ponieważ będzie wypad po angielsku. So let me start with introducing our guest today, Professor Jean from Stony Brook University. This is a state university in New York. He is working on particle physics, in particular neutrinos. He is uh, head of the group working on uh, those topics. And he has that with big successes, in particular, he got so a great prize in physics uh, in recent years. So this is one of the recognitions in, in physics. And apart from uh, science, he's also been interested in the science outreach. I'm a he gives lectures, for example, on physics of the spot. He gave such a lecture also yesterday in Warsaw, and it seems to be a very interesting topic. So if you would have one more stuff in the future, you might also ask him to give such a lecture to us. So this is Professor Jack, and I would also like to welcome one more special guest today, who is Professor Barbosa Tajogorzewska from English Institute here in the University of Warsaw. She will have a special role in this lecture too. So let us welcome Professor Jan. Delighted to be here. I came here uh, Sunday or something like that. Uh, I'm having a wonderful time. It's uh, uh, this. Uh, this is my first time in Poland, but uh, everything is great. There are even some some things I can't tell you right now, but it's trust me, it's fantastic. So <laughs> I'm having a great time. Uh, it's my pleasure to give this uh, lecture. Uh, this is based on some of the things what I will say in the beginning, is especially I see some young people. It's related to why I became a physicist and, and why I decided to do it. And uh, uh, I will try to tell you that physics studies, what we are doing, uh, is very complicated. It, it, it relates a lot of different people, many people working together. So how is we achieve, achieve discoveries and uh, how social, in terms of social point of how that works and uh, uh, some of the background stories, okay? Hopefully you will enjoy. I have a full one hour talk. I may, you know, if I talk too much, maybe go over a little bit. You're welcome to leave anytime, but uh, let's see how it goes. So, what is nothing? Tell me what is nothing. Lack of matter or, or energy, I would say. Okay. I'm not a physicist, I don't know. Okay, good. <laughs> it's your it's good answer. <laughs> so, this is nothing. Okay, that's uh, now in modern time, you know, China is rising up. We should all learn about Chinese characters also, right? So that character is, means nothing in Chinese character. It's my favorite character. I, when I was a kid, I loved it. And in fact, if you study Taoism or Buddhism, one of the state to reach Nirvana is called, uh, you get rid of everything in your mind. The state is reached by nothing in your mind or nothing in your heart. That is two, these two characters. This is nothing, that's mind. So I, I adopted it as, as my pen name and it was a, it's kind of presumptuous, but uh, I like it, so I just took it. And this is my brother's uh, writing of that uh, pen name. So, is Mu, yeah, yeah. So, <clears throat> I'm not Chinese, by the way. <laughs> So uh, is it nothing is, let's say in this room, right, if we seal up this room completely, we, if we take everything, we take all the airs out, vacuum, typically people think is uh, the vacuum is nothing, that's space. But if, let's assume you have God's glasses and look at the space. What we know as a physicist is if you wear a pair of God's glasses, can we turn off some of uh, front lights somehow? Um, you will see vacuum is full of stuff, individual, invisibles, quantum fluctuations, dark matter, dark energy, and neutrinos. So I have thought about these things a lot. When I was a kid, I decided to be a physicist about 11, 12 years old. You're a little bit older than that. I couldn't figure out the infinity. I couldn't figure out nothingness and the time, and that's when I decided to be a physicist. So uh, I thought I will learn a lot, and then I'll get some answers to that. Today, I know nothing. 
really. I didn't. Uh, I, I know more about that now, but I haven't gotten answer to most of the things I was asking at the time. But one thing I conclude is that when you think about this nothing in space and time, nothing does not exist. As soon as you are existing, then nothing cannot be existing. So think about that, and then this is not the main topic of this talk. So the main topic of this talk will be neutrinos. If we look at the, our universe, what we know, if you go outside, you look at the stars, it turns out the stars you're seeing Visible stars, only 0.5% of all of the matter or energy in the universe. Neutrinos, which we will talk about, is equal amount of that energy exists in our universe, 0.5%. And then there are another 3 4 cents or so kind of stuff we know, ordinary matter, but we don't see. That, that's another 4%. But if you look at all of them, rest of them, majority of part, 20, what happened? Something, something is trying to connect. So the majority of thing is, is dark matter is about 26%. This is thing, we know it exists. Uh, we have many evidence by astronomical observations, but we can't figure out what it is. So we are doing experiment, lots of, lots of experiments trying to figure this more out. And then there's another 70% of them, we call it dark space, dark energy. We say that because we don't know what it is. We just can't figure out. We know there is evidence from our uh, uh, surveys and things, but we, we don't know what it is. So young people, if you want to figure out the universe, you want to get Nobel Prize, there's uh, lots of rooms. Basically, we don't know anything, OK? So um, let's talk about how particle physicists approach uh, our work from very fundamental view, very global view. You all know Einstein, and in 2005, we celebrated 100 years of Einstein. And Einstein is a brilliant man. He did many, many different things. But one of the things he could not, even with his brilliant brain, could not solve was that he wanted to uh, unify so-called four forces in, the, uh, the, uh, in nature into one. So he dreamed about, can all forces in nature be unified in one form? And he could not do it, finish it. And so, this is what we are doing. If in, in, in essence, oh, here are some particle physics here. In essence, this is what we are dreaming about. We start out with a Newton. Newton look at the apple falling down, uh, looking at the, uh, the planets going around. He was able to connect the, the force, make the apple fall down, falling down, and the planets going around actually connected, and he found, defined that as a gravitational force. So that was actually the first unification, terrestrial and celestial force together. He made the first unification of two forces, and that is a gravitational force. And then we discovered electricity and magnetism. Uh, some of the people, young people, if you are smart, when you're high school, when you're learning electricity and magnetism, you should have thought about it. Ah, maybe this is coming from the same origin. That's actually what I was thinking of when I was a kid. In, indeed, this is actually, they are coming from the same origin. This is called quantum electrodynamics uh, that describes electromagnetic inter uh, inter uh, interaction. And then we have weak theory that describes how nuclear matters uh, decay. And then we have strong uh, uh, interaction, which is described in quantum chromodynamics. This uh, is the one that uh, makes the protons or neutrons together. And they are made out of positive charged particles, but somehow they, they should repel, but they are together because of this strong force. So those are four fundamental forces. So what we really want is, I mean, there's no reason nature should think the way we think. Why would nature should care about what, I, what I'm thinking? What we are thinking is that these forces should be somehow coming from common origin of way, way up in high, very high energy. And in fact, we uni they succeeded unifying so-called Q electromagnetic interaction and a weak theory into unified electroweak theory. There is a strong interaction we could not unify yet. If you do that, and that becomes grand unification theory. And then there's gravitation. Turns out to be the first one we have found, but it's the hardest one to deal with. And if we could put them together, make the whole thing, and it's called super string theory is the one trying to do that. And this is called the theory of everything, OK? Now, there's our, physics is based on experiment, 
uh, you can't just write down the equations or theory and you think you know what, it, what you're doing. It has to be supported by experiment. So on the way, we need to do a lot of this experiment. In particular, we need to have something called a proton decay, which supports these theories. Currently, we have something called a standard model particle physics. That standard model particle physics is not the unified theory. It is an amalgam of two different theories of unified electric theory plus QCD. And that's where we stand today. And we're trying to improve those things to this way. OK. Um, are we going to have discussions here, or how does it work? So at the end, we have questions. Hmm? At the end? At the end, yeah. Probably it's better to do it at the end. Okay. Something urgent? OK, let's do it at the end because of the time, right? So write it down. Let's do it at the end. So elementary particle standard model as a universe is described in very simple terms. We have four forces I talked about. There are four forces that make the things interact. But there are the particles that make the everything, fundamental block. You can group them into quarks and the leptons. And the quarks has up, down, charm, strange, top and bottom, six quarks. And the up and down quark is the ones that are making protons. And the leptons have the electron you know, most of you know. And the muon and tau, they are like cousins of each other. They are basically the same, but muon and tau are heavier than electron. And then we have this thing called a weird thing, neutrino. And neutrino has electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino going over the this thing, uh, each other. And uh, these particles all uh, in participate in the strong and this, all these four forces. But neutrino is the only one does not participate in strong or electromagnetic, only participating in weak interactions. And that is one of the reasons why neutrinos are very special. Also, neutrino is the only particle that does not have a charge among them. So neutrino is a very special matter particle. Now, on top of that, we have antiparticles. It turns out word is made out of particles. Your body, if you look at yourself, you have made out of protons and uh, neutrons. Those are all matter particles. But it turns out in the world, you can actually generate antimatter, antiparticles. This comes naturally in our uh, physical theory. We actually produce them by using accelerators. So we have proof that these things all exist. So each particle has antiparticles. It's amazing that, that it comes out to be that. And finally, to make the, uh, uh, the whole story, we have a thing called the Higgs particle. This is responsible for giving masses to all these particles. This is Holy Grail standard model. It was discovered in 2012 in the LHC experiment. I'm not going to talk about that today. I will talk about so-called these neutrinos, which is in standard model is assumed to be massless. Remember that. In our theory, we think it's a massless, has no mass. So, so let's go through some neutrino, uh, neutrino trivia. Neutrino is, ele is an elementary particle, has no mass, I just say, in standard model. Now, when particle has no mass, what it means is that uh, it has related to Einstein's special relativity. In Einstein's special relativity, anything has no mass, which means you cannot stop them and they have measure mass, and they have to move in the speed of light. So as soon as you create them, they will move around the speed of light all the time, infinity. So that's, the, that's what we believe in standard model neutrino is. Um, it has no electric charge, interacts a little with any other matter. It can pass through 50 billion miles of water or entire universe without interacting. It's an incredible particle. And, and because of that, imagine if I want to communicate with somebody far, far away galaxy in different star system, the best way of communicating is using neutrinos. Okay. And because of this, also, if you want to study inside of stars or inside of galaxies or black holes or whatever that may be, deepest things you want to study, neutrino is the best way of studying that because it's not affected by anything. It will carry all the information what you see in the deep inside. So it's a remarkable thing. And that gives a concept of a neutrino telescope. What is happening? Why is doing that? <clears throat> so neutrinos uh, uh, from the stars, solar neutrinos, 
Now, I want everybody to stick your finger out, do this. If you look at your fingertips, okay, if you look at fingertips, there are 50 billion neutrinos passing by right now every second. 50 billion. Do you feel it? Yeah. <laughs> you don't. I mean, this thing is going through your body all the time in an incredible amount of numbers, but you don't feel it at all because for neutrinos, your body is completely transparent. You don't exist. Okay? So, um, and then another remarkable thing is a supernova. A supernova is uh, when stars <clears throat> is born, it lives about typically two billion years. It's a very long time. And during that time, they uh, burned fuels through nuclear fusion. But at some point, it loses all its energy. Then the whole gravitational uh, force of the mass itself will collapse the star. And because of so much energy is going down into the core, in a bounce back, it explodes. And that explosion is the supernova. When it happens, 99% of energy of supernova is released in the form of neutrinos. So again, because of neutrino carries all of the information of what happened, by studying those neutrinos, we can understand exactly what happens with the supernova in its mechanism. Um, we have observed such phenomenon only once, 1987. We call it supernova 1970A. There was about 20 events uh, by two, three uh, detectors uh, in 10 second period of time. Imagine this thing lives two billion years, two billion years, and at one point it collapses, it releases energy in only 10 seconds. And you have to capture that. And then we did. That's really remarkable thing. It's an unbelievable thing. So that is the first and still only the neutrino observed from the astrophysical source other than sun. And it is a really triumph of supernova theory because we predicted that and it actually happened. Neutrinos so, from the Earth. And on Earth, uh, there's a, a huge amount of particles from outer uh, uh, space coming into the Earth, bombarding in our atmosphere, and it generates neutrinos. And those neutrinos are prevalent all over. I'm going to talk about that uh, today. And that, was the, uh, that created the discovery of non-zero neutrino mass. And there are terrestrial neutrinos produced by natural radi radioactivity. Right now, you're sitting there, and in, in the you know, ground, there's a lot of radioactivity. It generates 6 million neutrinos per uh, cubic centimeter, uh, square centimeter per second. And man-made neutrinos, we generate neutrinos by accelerators and reactors and such. And in fact, uh, a very sad uh, accident happened in the Fukushima nuclear, uh, nuclear reactor in Japan, and that released a lot of uh, uh, neutrinos along with other radioactive uh, problems. Homo sapiens neutrinos, your body, it turns out, also generate a neutrino. You eat a, put a banana, right? If you eat banana, it contains a potassium, and that decays in our body, about 20 milligrams a day. It generates 340 million neutrinos per day. So you are a nice neutrino generator. And uh, mother of all neutrino is so-called the relic neutrino. This is coming from one second after Big Bang. So at that point, there's many, many neutrinos released. These things are going around everywhere. Again, cubic centimeter uh, of volume now. There's about 300 such neutrinos floating around. It turns out detecting this is probably, as a particle physicist, mother of all experiment. If you can detect that, I will bow to you. That it's, a, it's one of the hardest things to do. OK, so now let's go back in the history a little bit, how we thought about neutrinos. And uh, the person who thought about first was a Pauli, Wolfgang and Pauli. And uh, he was studying in 1930s uh, beta decay uh, phenomenon. A beta particle is actually electrons. And he was studying these things. So when he studies, uh, electron comes out this way, and there's a, a recoiling particle the, the other way. People thought at the time this thing is decaying in a back-to-back, -to -back, two body. Then in physics, we can simply calculate the energy of this electron. It should be just one value. But when we do an experiment, it comes out to be a very continuous value. It's not a one value. So what's happening? So nobody could figure out. And Paolo was thinking and saying, hmm, maybe there's a something which is created, but we don't see. So he called that neutron. OK, he called it neutron. 
But neutron, what we know today, is not same. And then neutron was, in fact, uh, after he called it neutron, it was discovered next year, a uh, couple of years later by Chadwick. So that name, neutron, was taken away. So a uh, formula came and said he changed the name to neutrino. That's why, because he's Italian. In Italian, anything small is ino, right? So that's how neutron became neutrino. So this is uh, <coughs> one of my favorite uh, letters Pauli wrote when he thought about this neutrino. And uh, there was a conference in Tübingen, and he was supposed to go there. And then he decided he can't go, so he wrote it. Now he said, the title here is 1930. Dear radioactive uh, ladies and gentlemen, what a geek, you know, what a, he's a, I, I would never write a like, letter like that, but he, he, said, he said, radioactive ladies and gentlemen. And then he said, I have hit, on, hit upon a desperate rem remedy. And then he went on and uh, described what he thinks this missing particle is. In. Remarkably, a lot of things he said is actually correct. And some are not incorrect today, we know, but mostly correct. And then he said, this is something remarkable, but I don't feel, I don't feel secure enough to publish anything about this idea. Modern day theorists, they come up with any idea, they will write paper first. He, here, he was very cautious, and he was thinking, and he was not sure that it's, he's uh, really uh, uh, getting the right thing. So uh, this is a, the, the uh, uh, favorite line. And unfortunately, I cannot personally appear in Tübingen conference, since I'm indispensable here on the account of ball, uh, dense Venice ball, taking place in Zurich in the night, okay? So he has a priority set up correctly. <laughs> so there are um, uh, about five uh, Nobel Prizes given uh, with, uh, associated with the neutrinos. The first one was a theoretical. It has to do with something called a neutral current experimental observation we made in CERN and that was explained uh, through uh, neutrinos. And uh, that was 1979. 1988, uh, these three people received a uh, uh, Nobel Prize for the neutrino beam method and the demonstration of doublet structure of leptons through the discovery of muon neutrinos. Ah, if you think about it, when I show the first page of the uh, uh, building blocks of the universe, this electron neutrino, which is also with electron, muon neutrino is associated with muon, tau neutrino is associated with the tau, so muon neutrino is the second generation. Normally, you will discover the first one first. So indeed, uh, Frederick Reines uh, was given Nobel Prize in 1995 for the detection of neutrino. That was done in 1956. So first neutrino was de 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 detected in 1956. And then next one was detected in 1963 or something like that. But Nobel Prize given first to this one and then the first detection was given 1995, almost uh, seven years later. What happened? Listen carefully, especially young people. And then uh, 2002, uh, Ray Davis and then uh, Goshiba for pioneering contribution to astrophysics, in particular detection of cosmic neutrinos. This is uh, supernova neutrinos I was talking about. And then uh, also solar neutrino. And then uh, 2015, not long ago, uh, Gajita and then McDonald for the discovery of neutrino oscillations, which shows that neutrinos have mass. And that's the experiment uh, I was involved in, some of our colleagues here is involved in. Okay, so let's look at what happened to uh, Reinhard Cohen's uh, experiment. This was an uh, experiment detecting neutrinos coming from a reactor in the Savannah River. So the detector was a very simple, rather simple detector. It has the so-called, um, um, the, uh, sort of uh, liquid scintillator uh, detector with a, a five inch uh, PMTs. PMTs are basically a big uh, glass ball which is very sensitive to uh, the light, photon. And then in the, it has this blue part, is a so-called target part. It's filled with water and the cadmium uh, chloride. So what is essentially looking at is that neutrino comes from the reactor, which is anti-electron neutrino, comes in and it hits the proton and then it, turned, uh, it will kick out the neutron and a positron. Positron is antiparticle with electron. So then positron will see electron and it annihilates, generate two photons, and then this neutron will capture the by the cadmium and it generates another uh, photon. So by looking at so-called delayed signal, he was able to prove that neutrinos exist. So this is experiment. Interestingly, this principle is even today. 
is the same, basically the same principle. Uh, reactor experiment does the same thing. So when they did it, they found signal to uh, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the background ratio was a three to one. So that was confident enough they saw the actually uh, signal coming from anti-neutrinos coming from reactor. So in two, June 2056, 1956, they sent a telegram to Pauli. Remember Pauli is the guy who thought about this thing? So it's very interesting. This is like very old. Uh, so you can look in here. Professor Pauli is a receiver, Zurich University, Zurich. We are happy to inform you. This is coming from New York. Inform you that we have definitely detected the neutrinos from fission fragments by observing inverse beta decay of proton uh, observed cross sections. Agree well with expected six times 10 to minus 40, four square centimeters. Rhinus and then uh, Cowan. Okay? It's a very, very interesting telegram. So what was the problem? And then, uh, so that publication observed the cross-section at that time, 1956, was within 5% of theoretical prediction, which was 6.3 times 10 to minus 44. Although theoretical prediction itself has 25% uncertainty. So that's a little bit of a coincidence here, right? And then uh, four years later, the theory got revised because of some, uh, the people, person called C.N. Yang and T.D. Lee. I will talk about him a little bit later. And they have discovered their thing called a parity violation. This is a fundamental discovery of sim breaking of symmetry. And then that has changed the theoretical prediction to a factor of two. So that became uh, 10 times 1.7 instead of 6.3. Well, then uh, uh, this experiment of uh, Fred Rhinus and then, uh, collaborators reanalyzed their data. And they say their now uh, measurement is 12 times 10 to minus 44. So it, this is the same data. So when these things happen, people some tend to be what? Little suspicious, because how can you have the same data, you analyze again, you get factor of two. So this is part of the reasons why uh, Rhinus et al. did not get the receive. There are some other stories behind it. But for 40 years, it's kind of sad, because it, they did something remarkable. But very, very, very long time, I didn't get the Nobel, didn't recognize with the Nobel Prize for 40 years. By the time when he had, I knew him personally, by the time I knew him, uh, 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 he got Nobel Prize, his health was not good, so he really didn't enjoy much. And after that, so it is, isn't one of those, uh, it's a good story, but it's also a sad story. So Pauli, this is a historic photo. I, I think probably I'm the only one that has it. Um, it was given by Morris Goldhauer, another legendary uh, person. This is a person who did an experiment, uh, ingenious experiment, to measure whether neutrino has, are left-handed or right-handed. The way it is defined is a neutrino has a direction of, of going, and there's spin, of has neutrino has spin, whether it's turning clockwise or counterclockwise. I don't know what it is doing, but okay. So anyway, but you see you have two other ones. It's okay, right? So. It turns out all of the, they, he did an experiment prove that all of the neutrinos are left-handed, okay? So there's a breaking of symmetry. And so he was a direct, uh, he was in Brookhaven, Brookhaven National Laboratory uh, 30 minutes away from my uh, home uh, institution. He, Pauli was visiting. Uh, he told me that he's a good friend of mine. He told me that he staged this photo, photo shot. So he was standing here talk, pretending talking and, and the photographer passing by took this photo. And uh, so he, this is something what he said. Mr. Radioactive, because he, you know, I think protons decay. And uh, he said, you cannot be serious. You must be more desperate than I am. And then he said, I proved that neutrinos are left-handed as well. And he said, I heard that, truly amazing. I used to say, I don't believe God is left-handed. OK? So that led to uh, what I call 1998 neutrino revolution. This is the observation of neutrino oscillation by the super Kamikande collaboration, uh, which proved neutrino has mass. In the standard model, what I said, neutrino has no mass, massless, which means you have to move around the speed of light all the time. It's, we proved that it's no longer true. Okay, so let's look at that. The way it came about is 1970s, the theory 
was developed for towards grand unification, which you remember very first I was talking about, we're trying to get unified theories. And then those theories all turn predicted protons, which our body is made of. Our body has about 10 to 27 protons. And protons will decay eventually. And they, so they predict it. So that drove a lot of particle physicists go build the detectors to look for proton decay. Because if we discover that, it will be revolutionary, uh, a revolutionary observation. It will change the physics. But it turns out we didn't discover it. And, in, and uh, these detectors are great detectors for neutrinos. And neutrino was actually background to proton decay searches. So this is something you have to remember. Science, you can't always do things particularly just to do that and you, know, you make something and if you don't see it, you, it's failure. It's not. And this experiment tells you that we failed to discover proton decay. But because we built brilliant instrument and we had a, a, a brilliant mind working there, government supported and then made a discovery of neutrinos and neutrino oscillations. So other things happen. That's how society has to invest. So here is the super Kamikande detector, which is a, this is a really magnificent detector. Some of you have been there, right? Worked on it. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you go in there, it, this is a detector like a, 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 one of the most awesome sites. Imagine bigger than this hall is it's filled with a glass balls, completely. It has 40 meters diameter, 40 meters height and has 11,000 20-inch PMTs, which is like this big. And then uh, outside, um, out, here's some photos. Let's look at it. So here's a super camera kind of detector inside. It looks like that. And then this is in a, it's outside a part of the, this detector looks like that. You don't have to know the t too much details of things. So let me just give you a brief um, uh, principle how these detectors work. One more time. If you don't know Chinese characters or Japanese characters, you know, you gotta learn these things in modern day, right? You know how to read this thing? What does it say? That says a new Torino. This is a Japanese writing of a neutrino. Um, this is called a trank of light, and then here this one says uh, proton decay. Okay? So, right. Now, you have water, and then neutrino come into your detector. And as I said, neutrino doesn't interact at all. So the gazillions go through doing nothing. But one out of gazillion will interact. And it, let's say it hits electron. And it, because it has energy and momentum, it comes in, boom, hits electron. Then electron will start moving. So in our point of view, suddenly there's nothing happens. Suddenly some electron in, in the detector is moving. Now it turns out when electron or charged particle has enough energy, it can go faster than speed of light in water. If you know anything about special relativity, it says that nothing can go faster than speed of light. Well, how that can be possible? But you have to read the fine print. And she's a lawyer, so you know, the fine print in special relativity says nothing goes faster than speed of light in a vacuum. So yes, it says that. Yeah, you're a lawyer. Go check that. Um, so in water, actually things can go faster than speed of light, which is a 30% less than in vacuum. So light goes slowly in, in water, okay? So because of now charged particles going faster than speed of light inside the water, they generate a thing called the light called track of uh, radiation. Those are the light. As they travel in the water, comes out, and it hits this PMT, which is made out of uh, thin metal, what we call pulse cathode. And then this light hits the photocathode using uh, Einstein's photoelectric effect. Uh, electrons got kicked out. Then we put in a very high voltage. This electron accelerates and hits this metal and generates other electrons and amplifies. So it's a very simple device. We measure when the time arrives uh, of the charge and the amount of charge we collected. And then we measure everything. And then we can characterize what happened. That's how simple it works. Just giving the flavor of it. Let's say if we have electron got kicked out or muon uh, was traveling in the water, the, their electron and muon are basically cousins. They are exactly the same. The only difference is that muon is like two times uh, heavier than electron. So let's say if you have crowded a place and you are a very light person, when you try to go through very fast, what's going to happen? You're going to be bouncing around, right? 
And then muon is very heavy, so it doesn't bounce, it just plow through. So tranquil light, what you see is that electrons, because it bounces around, the light is very uh, fuzzy, so you see fuzzy patterns. But muons, because just just go straight, it has a very sharp edge. And that's how we distinguish which one is created by muon, which one is created by electron. So this is uh, how we make how state-of-art detector. L listen, uh, look at carefully how it, this is a Japanese worker blowing PMT's glasses one by one, okay? It doesn't look like that much of state-of-art, but that's how, how all those uh, PMT was made, and I, well, I love this video. And uh, it turns out at the time, we needed 11,000 PMTs. We think it's a lot, but industry standard, they're making billions units. 11,000 are not that much. So making a factory was more costly than just using people, and they were actually more precise than uh, at that time what factory could make. So here's the, um, how emulsive neutrinos are produced. I said uh, before a little bit. From outer space, protons or, or heavy ions will come in and it hits uh, emulsive, the nucleus, and it generates a so-called hadronic shower. It creates pions and other particles. Pions decays to muons, and muon decays to electron, and then electron neutrino and muon neutrino like that. So if we just look at very simplified this thing, the number of muon neutrinos and the number of electron neutrinos you see should be about two to one ratio. And we can calculate these things and we can model these things. But what we see did not agree with what we were expecting. So there's a problem in terms of our understanding of emerson neutrinos. So now I do not expect you to uh, understand this uh, formula. I will explain to you in a word. The reason I wrote it down, I had an other illustration of like, baby was born and a man and, and a boy and girl and changing things. I do not like to make analogies that mislead people. So I wrote down fam, uh, f a formula, which is correct formula, but you don't have to understand it. Basically what happens when neutrinos are born, it's born, uh, born with a flavor, either it's electron or muon or tau. But they have a mass, but you can measure it individually what it is. It turns out when they travel, they have different type of masses they can acquire. That's what we call it mass eigenstates. And because of the mixture of these masses they can acquire, in the end, if you go through quantum mechanical calculation, electron neutrino can turn into muon neutrino. This is like a bizarre thing. A thing, muon neutrino can turn into electron neutrino or vice versa. This is one of the most bizarre phenomena in quantum mechanics. Because of mixing in mass eigenstate and weak eigenstate, a particle can turn into completely the other one, okay? So it's hard to believe that. You can write it down, equation, but do you really believe that can actually happen? And then this is what we actually saw. So here is an illustration of what we have seen in Super Kamikande. Imagine an Earth, this is an Earth here. Super Kamikande detects a deep underground about one kilometers. And neutrinos coming from the, uh, above you and then through you because neutrino uh, Earth is completely transparent. It's all directions. So if we look at the neutrinos coming from above us, it was generated in atmosphere about only 20 kilometers or so. So it doesn't have much uh, path length. It doesn't oscillate, so stays same. So it goes, muon neutrinos comes, and then all of the muon neutrinos just detected as muon neutrinos. But when we look at the ones coming through the Earth, look at it. It oscillates into muon neutrino to tau neutrino, tau to muon, tau goes back and forth like that. And then some of them arrive in a detector as tau neutrino. Some of them arrive as muon neutrino. So if it's long enough, it's about 50-50. Now, tau neutrino, it happened to be, it's very hard to detect. So our detector is basically invisible. So we don't see that. So you remove that, then what happens? I'm expecting two muon neutrinos we see from the coming from the top, only one from bottom, right? So we expected that, and that's what we saw. This, this hit diagram here showing, this is a historical uh, 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 slide. This is a slide shown in 1998 conference in, uh, in Japan, and uh, this person, uh, Kajita, is the one uh, eventually got Nobel Prize as making presentation. We showed electron neutrinos prediction and then muon neutrino prediction now, electron, the, this 
So here, I want to explain this one a little bit. This is a cosine of thang, uh, theta. One means that neutrinos are coming from the top, this way. Minus one means coming through the Earth. Zero is horizontal, okay? For electron neutrinos, the, our observation is the same as what we predicted, so oscillation did not happen. For muon neutrinos, you see the things coming from the top agrees exactly what our, we are expecting, but the, the one coming through the Earth is only half we saw. Now we go through the statistical analysis of this, and we conclude that we are uh, so-called a 6.2 sigma confident uh, for our discoveries in my work. Yeah. Which corresponding to what? 0.000001% to be wrong. So we were pretty sure we were right, okay? So uh, this is an interesting uh, personal story. Xian Yang, who discovered uh, the, um, it, it, should, it should be interesting to you. Xian Yang, who discovered the parity violation, she is also the one person uh, who invented the yang mill theory, which is the foundation of all sort of modern uh, uh, theory of particle physics. This brilliant person. So he was my colleague uh, at Stony Brook University. I met him in uh, 1997 at the parking lot. I don't know why, I always meet him at the parking lot. And then I said, uh, Frank, looks like a neutrino has a mass, because I already know at the time neutrino is oscillating. And he's the one really convinced that neutrino does not have mass, because he said, it can't be. Mass of neutrino is so beautiful. He's, a, he's coming from Chinese culture. He believes nature has some kind of structure. He believes in a philosophical way of looking at things. So he said the symmetry of the neutrino not having mass is so beautiful, and you know, mathematical is so, so nice. And then 1998, uh, uh, I saw him again after we made uh, this, uh, the announcement. He said, I guess you're right. Nature is mysterious somewhere in many ways, right? And then uh, at, uh, about three years ago, I visited him, and now he's in China. And he told me, on neutrinos, my intuition has failed. So even the guy, as brilliant as a, a CN Yang, he just didn't quite get it right in neutrinos. And that's one of those reasons. Neutrinos are considered to be most enigmatic particle. It's the most difficult thing to understand. In neutrino physics, experiments always lead theorists. Theorists didn't predict anything. We always make something, then they uh, come with a theory, post-prediction. In collider physics, you have all of the theory. People are keep finding things what theories uh, predict them. So this is very interesting about neutrino physics. Okay, so now moving into astronomical, uh, physical neutrinos and solar neutrino problem. One of the big, big, biggest issues we had in the 1960s all the way to 1990s was that we were able to detect neutrinos coming from the sun, which I told you, 50 billion neutrinos in, uh, in your fingertips every second. Even though that many, it was very difficult to detect them. Um, so first, John Bacall, showing here, came with a, uh, the, the theory to calculate all of these reactions that happens inside the sun, the fusion reactions, very in detail. So he predicted how many neutrinos should come out. And neutrinos coming from the sun is pure electron neutrino. It's not an electron anti-neutrino coming from the reactor. It's a pure electron neutrino. And this person, uh, Ray Davis, he wanted to do the experiment to detect this once. He went to Homestake Mine in South Dakota uh, in US. He, because it was acting mine at the time, he dealt with the owners and he was able to get space there. And he built this detector, which is uh, 10,000, uh, 600 tons of uh, cleaning fluid. And then what he was looking at is a neutrino coming from the sun, interact on chlorine 37, turning into argon 37, and then coming, electron coming out. He expected only 1.5 argon items per day. Okay, you have 600 tons of thing. He was a chemist. He was actually not a particle physicist. He was a chemist. So he used a chemical assay. All of these things, he drained and, and look at every drop and measuring this, taking six, 10 atoms out of 600 tons of it. I mean, this is crazy. This is kind of experiment I will never do or I will never think about. But he was persistent. He did the experiment. And many people didn't believe it, including me. So here's a, a measurement. Don't worry about this unit. 
Here's his uh, experimental measurements since from 1966 to 1980. These are the bottom, the filled one. These are a white uh, open circle is a John Buckle's calculation. They don't agree. But can, think about it. I mean, you have to go through such a complicated calculation. So nobody believed John Buckle's calculation. And then he had to go through 600 tons of things, and he had to kind of count a few atoms. Nobody believed the experiment. So nobody believed any of these things. So they, we, there was some issues of disagreement. Nobody believed anything for a long time. And then ex uh, experimental data alone has a lot of fluctuations for all these years. But these two people, I give them incredible amount of credit that I got to know them first personally as well. And the, the ed education, and they were uh, convinced that they were right, right? So they persist in and continually uh, refining their measurement and refining their uh, theory. And in the end, this experiment, the Kamiokande experiment, was a precursor of Super Kamiokande experiment came. And this experiment had the ability, looking at elect neutrino, electron neutrino coming from the sun, when it interacts with the electron, electron goes in the same direction where neutrinos came from. So you could point back. The Davis experiment was a chemical experiment. You don't know where neutrinos are coming from. That's why we didn't believe it. This experiment could see the sun. So now you have a background in the direction of sun, you see big signal. So there was no doubt we see neutrinos coming from the sun, okay? But when we measure the rate, how much neutrons are coming from the sun, it was only half of what we predicted, just like Ray Davis' experiment has seen. So then people started paying attention. John Bakar's theory and also Ray Davis' experiment, maybe they were right. So we did more experiment. And uh, well, before that, actually this is one of my favorite uh, slides. I would like you to appreciate it in artistic or scientific point of view. What you are seeing is image of sun uh, uh, taken with the neutrinos. So if you see the neutrinos coming from the sun, and then, uh, as I said, neutrino will interact with the electron, electron recoils, and it trajects back to the sun position. So you can accumulate a lot of data. You can image the sun underground. So I say, we see stars underground, right? And so this is what it looks like. Sun looks like if you are a neutrino uh, point of view. Except the resolution is quite poor. You see the pixel? That one pixel is actually the size of sun. So if you want to make a detailed uh, sun image, it's, this is not the way to do it. But it's, it's a, for me, it's a beautiful. You, know, look, you can actually see sun with a neutrino point of view. So this one, uh, you don't have to pay too much attention. The only thing you have to think about is that these blue bars are now many other experiments done the experiment. Blue bars are the ones expected by, measured by experiment. The central one is a theoretical prediction by John Bacall. And the manual experiment now disagree and uh, confirm that what uh, Ray Davis is saying is correct. And in the end, what, after Snow experiment and Super Kamikande experiment, all of that, we have confirmed that neutrino coming from the sun oscillates. And then if we add them all together, it per agrees perfectly with the theory. So <clears throat> this one was uh, 40, uh, almost 40, 40 years of, of struggle, both theoretically and experimentally. In a, and because they're persistent, it turned out to be all proven right. Okay? Then uh, the one I talked about, super, uh, supernova neutrinos, 1987, we were very lucky. And the, there's a large Magellanic cloud. This is not on our ga Milky Way galaxy, but it's about uh, uh, 50 kiloparsec away. This is before supernova happened, what it looks like in that sky. This one matches with that, okay? And right here, nothing there, boom. And supernova, when supernova explodes, the brightness of supernova can match entire galaxy because energy is so much, right? The, as I said one more time, remarkably, neutrino carries out 99% of that, that energy of explosion, and it, it lasts only 10 to 20 seconds. Unbelievable. So this is what they saw. There, there, was a, there are three experiments that were operating, and here is the time, 0 to 12 seconds. These are number of events seen by three different experiments. So there's no doubt that we saw neutrinos coming from supernova. 
as I said, it is a remarkable confirmation of core collapse uh, supernova theory. So if you think about another way is that particle physics, I mean, I'm, as, 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 as a clan, a member of the particle physics, when I see these things, it really is amazing. We are just doing purely calculations, knowing all kinds of physics principles, and go through the star ev evolution, and do all of things, and then finally you predict there will be neutrinos coming out 10, 20 seconds after two billion years. Just think about that process. It's just incredible. That's what particle physicists do. So with that, Nobel Prize was given 2002 to Ray Davis and then Goshiba. Same as Fred Reines, Ray Davis, you remember Ray Davis first saw his experiment in the 1960s, right? He got it in 2002. By that time, he was very uh, old. And then, in fact, uh, after he got Nobel Prize, uh, he made an appearance uh, at, at the Stony Brook University. We had a small neutrino conference. And then uh, he just didn't have uh, a lot of uh, uh, facility of thinking. So he was he, aware of he got Nobel Prize, but he was not really fully enjoying the moment. Um, and, and also, US is very funny. When you get, in, I don't know, uh, do you have Nobel Prize winners in Poland? If you get Nobel Prize, probably you'll be swamped by you know, reporters and people. On it. In the US, you get Nobel Prize, not that many people care about you. He came, sat on the, the conference right there. There was nobody was, nobody was really you know, bothering him until he was there. And, uh, it was a kind, of, kind of almost luxurious. So this is Ray Davis, and this is Goshiba, who uh, the, uh, uh, started neutrino physics in Japan built a Kamiokande detector and Super Kamiokande, proposed Super Kamiokande detector. Well-deserving people got that. And here is the, uh, that neutrino uh, conference at Stony Brook. This is Ray Davis. And then this is Morris Goldhauer, the photo I show you with the uh, uh, Pauli, OK? Oh, jeez. So I call that uh, two giants and a shrimp. And then this is 2015, here's Gajita and uh, Alt McDonald, there was a, a spokesperson of Snow Experiment that they both got Nobel Prize for confirming the neutrino oscillation uh, phenomenon. So for the discovery of neutrino oscillation, which showed that neutrino have mass. Now one of the things uh, what I'm talking about here has uh, one thing, if you go to Nobel Prize win, uh, the uh, website, all of the past Nobel Prize winners has just name and their names shows up. This, this time when they gave, they put the experiment name underneath. Why they did that? Because when Nobel died, he had a will, and the will has strictly says, you can only give the Nobel Prize to three people. And you cannot give to that uh, post-mortem, you cannot give to that person. So even though there are hundreds of people worked in the same experiment, you can only, one person can get it, okay? So I think, I don't know, I didn't communicate over the uh, committee, they decided to put at least the name in there so that the name of the experiment is recognized, right? So one person, what I believe, and at that time when Nobel Prize was given, should have gotten Nobel Prize, Yoji Totsuka, this person. He was the one, uh, Goshiba uh, um, proposed the experiment of Super Kamikaze. He was the one actually carried out building it and executing it and all of that. And when we discovered neutrino oscillation, he was a spokesperson. And then in 2001, we had an incredibly bad extent. You know, just this big 20-inch PMTs I showed you, that's a vacuum inside. And 11,000 ohms buried underwater, 40 meters deep underwater, that's of eight, five atmospheric pressure. So one night, one of this PMT bro got broken, and because it's a vacuum, all the water rushed in, just like supernova collapse, and then when it rushes in and it bounces back, and that force of bouncing back was so strong, it destroyed the PMT next to it, and then chain reaction. So we destroyed about two-thirds of the uh, PMTs. I was a member of that experiment. And that cost about $20 million. Now, if that happened in the United States, I was the head of that experiment, and my head would be chopped off. I would, my experiment was done. But in Japan, they allowed to rebuild it, and he was showed a true leadership at the time. I was really, truly uh, uh, impressed. Everybody was paralyzed, what to do? And he showed up one week later, he said this. We will rebuild the detector, there's no question. 
And then, <clears throat> and then he was able to uh, organize committees and things and just got it done within one month. You probably don't know, even though you are working there. Within one month, he made the committee make the recommendation, rebuild the detector. So we pulled together all the resources, we distributed to PMTs. Within a year, we rebuild the detector, we start taking K2K data. That's just incredible thing. So I also have a special relationship with him. This is uh, 2011. I was the uh, first uh, US person who uh, joined this experiment. And um, all you, I wanted to say is that it's 1991. And then he says that let me know Dr. Jones' bitnet address. Most of you don't know what bitnet address is. This is the very beginning of the uh, internet era, right? So and we had to start common communications. That was the beginning of the US-Japan uh, collaboration in super Kamikaze experiment. And then uh, when uh, that year, when we uh, Nobel Prize was given, Physics Today uh, contacted me, and then uh, somehow my opinions about the Nobel Prize and things like that. I say, well, it, you know, they're all deserving. It's, it's, uh, it's, I, there's no controversy in that. But on the other hand, because uh, the the rule of Nobel Prize is uh, somewhat archaic because it, it limits the three people and all this stuff. A dead person cannot get, and all of that. John Bacall and uh, uh, Yoji Dotsuka really should have been gotten that honor. And then, so what I, because I'm a sports guy, you, I, uh, I think introduction, you heard that I gave a physical sports talk. In sports, what happens? If Poland wins a World Cup, then whole team and whole country is a champion, right? And then what? Maybe Robert Lewandowski will become MVP or something like that. So in, in some ways that uh, uh, now we are moving in big signs, in big the, uh, collaborations. Uh, I think that is a more natural way of doing it because it's very difficult to select one person to be the singularly responsible for achieving that uh, discovery. So now we have, after the, this uh, revolution, we have a global re uh, the race to measure all different things about neutrinos. Uh, I don't want to go through all of this, just so you can see the, see the chart. Uh, one of my biggest contributions, I named this experiment called the K2K, and then it was T2K, so you, don't, you didn't know that, right? Um, so what we are doing is this. Now we have this picture of electron neutrino, muon neutrino, tau neutrino, and their anti-neutrino pairs. They can oscillate to anything. So like, muon neutrino can go to tau neutrino, uh, muon neutrino can oscillate to electron neutrino, uh, anti muon neutrino can go oscillate this. Electron neutrino can go this way. Like you know everything. So we measured all of those things now. Okay. So one of the um, uh, main achievement we made in, with uh, our collaborators here is a T2K experiment, and this is an experiment utilizing accelerator in the east coast of Japan, uh, about three hours of north of Tokyo. We generate protons, accelerate protons, about 30 GeV of energy. And then we shoot at target and generate a whole bunch of neutrinos. We shoot that uh, through the Earth, 295 kilometers in the west coast of Japan, where super kamikaze detector is. So we will detect it first at the, when it generated, and then we predict how much should arrive in the super kamikaze detector, and we compare measurement with our prediction. That's, it's very simple. That's how we do it. So that was the experiment, and uh, we were looking for particularly muon neutrinos generated by the accelerator, converting into electron neutrino, but positively identifying those ones that actually turned into electron neutrino. So that was our goal. All of the experiments done before was uh, neutrino was generated and it disappeared, but we didn't know actually what happened. So we wanted to make sure the neutrino is actually turning into other ones, positively identified. So we set out to goal to do that, and then we actually observed that. So we observed muon neutrinos go through the Earth, and then it shows up in Tupacamacande as an electron neutrino. So in the beginning, we only saw six events in 2011, but it was an incredible uh, uh, observation. We were really excited. It also happened to be the same year we had a big earthquake, so it's like so much of emotion, so much things happening. Um, and then, but we are pretty sure, so we published that. Uh, uh, so some of the academicians here, the uh, citation is very important for all of the, our uh, work. And that paper has almost 2,000 citations already, okay? 
And then, and then uh, years later, we uh, confirmed these things and we made the final dis uh, discovery. So with that, uh, this experiment, as well as many other experiments who contribute to understanding of neutrino oscillation, received another prestigious uh, prize called the Breakthrough Prize in fund Fundamental Physics in 2016. These are the experiments who got it, including Super Kamikande, K2K, and T2K. For the fundamental discovery and exploration of, uh, of neutrino oscillations, revealing a new frontier beyond and possibly far beyond the standard model of particle physics. One of the nice things about this is that it was given to whole collaboration. In fact, if you go to Breakthrough Prize webpage, they listed all, every single collaborators, including graduate students. So it was very encouraging for them because they can see, do you have your name, any of you? Yeah, yeah. 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 So it was, uh, you can actually go see there, your name is now show up as a laureate. And then also because they, are, they want to be chic, they put alphabetic order in the first name, not the last name. So what do we do now? So I'm starting to go in the phase of concluding my talk. So all of that, but one thing we haven't done is uh, there's a fundamental problem in our understanding of the universe. That is, if you look at on the onset of Big Bang, it was a really, really high temperature of condensed of everything. Everything in the universe we see was in, in a sense in a point. So when that Big Bang happened, there's no fundamental reason, theoretically, there are more matter than antimatter, because matter and antimatter, they cancel each other out. So when it came out, they should have produced the same number of matter and antimatter. But today, after 13.8 billion years later, you look at it, you look around. Everything you see is made out of matter. I met out of matter. I went yesterday to Old Town in Wausau. It was very nice. It's made out of matter. We checked galaxies. We checked far away. Everywhere we look at the universe, everything is made out of matter. What happened? What happened to all these antimatters which was created in the Big Bang? So this is one of the biggest mysteries in science. So I'm here making a very simple uh, argument. It's a much more complicated thing. So what we believe right now, we have, we have a paradigm. We call it leptogenesis. In here, we think very, very beginning of Big Bang, there was a cousin of neutrino, which is a very, very heavy neutral particle existed. And they decayed, because these very heavy particles, they take decay. They decayed the neutrino and Higgs. This is a particle, the holy grail particle. But because this is a neutral, they can, same guy can decay the anti-neutrino in Higgs. They are allowed to do that. But this process is called the charge parity uh, process. If this process is slightly different, th they, this one goes to this neutrino more than anti-neutrino, then you will have more particles than antiparticles. All right? So, hmm. So we are thinking. So this could happen. Where after Big Bang, there were gazillions and gazillions of matter and a gazillion gazillions of uh, antimatter. But then antimatter, when they see each other, they annihilate and generate light. But because of that, hybrid neutrino generate a little more matter neutrino than anti-neutrino. That remained, and that's us. If this didn't happen, we wouldn't exist. So CP violation in the lepton sector plays a critical role in this process. Therefore, CP violation should be investigated now by us. So how can we do these things? So now we are in the quest for CP violation in the lepton sector. This is a journey through exploration of neutrino oscillations by many of my colleagues and myself and then thousands of people in the world. So I showed you this thing before. Now we are looking particularly at this. If you generate the muon neutrinos, anti-muon neutrinos, they go mostly to tau neutrino or tau anti-neutrino, but some of them goes to muon neutrino to electron neutrino. This is what we discovered with T2K, electron neutrino appearance of a muon neutrino. Now we can do the same thing with the muon anti-neutrino and it, let it uh, oscillate to anti-electron neutrino. CP is conserved, charge parity is, symmetry is conserved, that rate should be exactly the same to each other. But if we measure it, they are different, that indicates CP is violated. And that may hint us 
how universe has evolved, we end up with being exist. This is a uh, uh, scientific uh, uh, page. Uh, again, for the purpose of make, giving you the correct information, I did not uh, make this one into watered down version. You don't have to understand the plot. All it's saying, we have scientific analysis and evidence that this charge parity violation is now, we know about 95% confident way we can say it is violating, 95%. Now, 95% in science, we don't think it is that serious. 99.7% still we don't believe we are so confident. It need to be 99 point what? 9999, nine, nine, something like that. So we are trying to do an experiment which will conclude these things in the highest possible uh, confidence. So that's what, this is where we are now. We are trying to continue to improve the experiment and make it into more confidence, better confidence. But it will take takes a long time. This is a very difficult experiment. Hundreds of people are working on it for many, many years. So in US, we are trying to do a different experiment, a bigger experiment. This is an experiment utilizing accelerator in the Fermilab in Chicago. We shoot neutrinos 1,300 kilometers away to South Dakota, where Ray Davis did the experiment. And then you see the oscillation. And you measure the difference between muon neutrino oscillation and anti-muon neutrino oscillation. Okay. So here's the uh, video of that. Now, in the meanwhile, I will also say there is a uh, a similar project is being proposed in Japan called the Hyper Kamiokande. Some of the uh, members of the, the, uh, um, the Poli Polish TTK group is in participating in that. That project is still disc being discussed, not uh, uh, approved yet, but this experiment is approved in US. So you can see uh, how it's done. You, first, you use the uh, proton accelerator, linear superconducting accelerator pro accelerated go through the booster and go into the feed in the ring. And then those, those protons are extracted out, hitting the target, okay? And then the, that uh, first neutrino generated is uh, detected by near detector, and data goes up. And those neutrinos now go to 1,300 uh, kilometers all the way to the South Dakota through the Earth, and it will be detected here, some of them. Now, I have to confess, we are one of the most wasteful scientists. Because how many neutrinos we generate? We generate gazillions and gazillions of them. We, only, we throw away everything. We only throw one out of gazillions of them to do our experiment. So if you think about that way, we are very wasteful. Uh, okay. But anyway. So here's the detector detecting those things, and the data comes out. It goes all around the world. We will analyze. And hopefully, within about 15 years or so, we will discover CP violation, and we'll have better understanding of the universe. OK, so let me summarize. We are now, uh, I was a sports guy, but also I was also a mountain climber, rock climber. I like to give a mountain climbing analogy. And if you go try to go uh, uh, climb Mount Everest, a lot of times the cloud, clouds there are fuzzy. You don't, in the beginning, you don't see. But we are in a situation, I think we have a clear picture of CPU violation, charge parity violation. That's, we see the peak. Now, everybody trying to go there. So T2K experiment I talked about is in Camp 2. <laughs> Nova is in Camp 1. And then here's the base camp. Dune and Hyper-K is still in the base camp. They're trying to gather more money and then support and equipment and things like that, training. And then there's something else here. I'm not, I'm not going to talk about it, but that's what is happening. So, but it, this journey is long. T2K may never actually get here. Maybe somewhere here, OK? And then these guys also probably not. These two experiments is the one really trying to go there. But it will be 10, 15, 20 year process. OK, so here I'm going to uh, conclude. Uh, Professor Mao Gorjata Gorjogorzevska. Uh, I'm trying to say. <laughs> Let's. Uh, uh, 
she is the head of uh, uh, English Studies, Institute of English Studies, and I'm pleased to honor to have her to discuss. Next page, the, this is a poem written by very famous poet, John Updike. And then as far as I know, this is only poem written about particle, elementary particle, okay? So this is about neutrinos. So she will uh, read it and, and, and give us a little comments about what she thinks about this uh, poem. Thank you very much. Um, uh, it is indeed uh, a great pleasure to uh, have a look at neutrinos from a completely different perspective, that is perspective of poetry and literature. Uh, let us first listen to the poem. Neutrinos, they are very small. They have no charge and have no mass and do not interact at all. The Earth is just a silly ball to them through which they simply pass, like dust maids down a drafty hall or photons through a sheet of glass. They snub the most exquisite gas Ignore the most substantial wall, cold shoulders steel and sounding brass, insult the stallion in his stall, and scorning barriers of class, infiltrate you and me. Like tall, like tall and painless guillotines, they fall down through our heads into the grass. At night, they enter at Nepal and pierce the lover and his lass from underneath the bed. You call it wonderful. I call it crass. Uh, the poem uh, appears to be very witty. Um, uh, my first association when I read it, it was, uh, perhaps people always associate things with other things they know best, uh, was with metaphysical English metaphysical poetry of the 17th century, where uh, poets uh, liked to uh, connect uh, emotion and intellect and liked to address issues that were then raised in science. Uh, this is, uh, I thought, a poem like uh, one of uh, Herbert or John Donne or uh, any of the group. But then uh, when I looked at it again, it uh, is a poem very much about humans rather than about particles, if one pays uh, careful attention to it. Uh, it is a poem about being so much dissatisfied with a world that cares so little about humans. Uh, the title, Cosmic Gull, refers to something very unpleasant, cosmic insolence, the fact that we are ignored by those particles that have such an easy access to us and leave us so little space for interfering with them. Uh, notice how much pain there is in this poem. Uh, on the one hand, it affects all spheres of our being. There is a mention of love. There appears the lover and his lass from underneath the bed, uh, obviously those that come to us from the other side of the earth. But there is also a mention of guillotine, uh, so, every day, we are beheaded by those invisible visitors um, and infiltrated. Nobody likes to be infiltrated. Uh, this very, very intimate contact with us without our permission is something that can indeed be called cosmic gall, that is, cosmic insolence. And yet, at the same time, the poet would not be a poet if he didn't try to render it with the quality of words. Uh, neutrinos are nothings, uh, if nothings here in uh, plural really applies, but notice how he manages through the use of what in very standard classes of poetry we would call masculine rhymes, that is, those rhymes on one-syllable words. The poem is filled with very short words, and this is the best way one can do to actually illustrate the, the fact that neutrinos have this diminutive um, uh, morpheme in their name, that they are so small. Small mass, 
all ball pass whole glass gas wall brass stole class tall fall grass nepal last call crass it almost all seems to boil down to one syllable um, to one sound in the syllable and just to rhymes the poem is really minimalistic in its discussion of the complexity of what you have heard about and that's probably the best thing John Updike could achieve. Uh, not to say too much about things that weigh so little. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the fantastic, insightful commentary. I have heard about these things uh, different people, different times. It's interesting, different perspectives. Um, OK, so I just want to make the last comment. He says, have no mess, right? I know, we know it's wrong, right? Yeah, but, po but poets can be wrong. It's OK, <laughs> right? I mean, look, he's not a scientist. So that's all right. So uh, just take that away. I would like to thank my host, uh, T2K, NCBJ group, I don't know what the, how to pronounce that, uh, but they are here. They've been a wonderful host. They invited me to come here and then take care of me and everything. They are also very important part of the, this photo itself is a T2K Polish group. I think it's actually much bigger, but uh, the, the people who are happen to be in the photo is not. Uh, but uh, these people has been doing fantastic work and T2K experiment, and now well, more recently in a Super K so they are playing in a major role in a, in a neutrino experiment uh, in the world. So thank everyone. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions? Photons don't have charge. Uh, photons are photons are antiparticles. For example, you, you photons don't have antiparticles, right? Uh, it's itself. Uh, so how can neutrinos have antiparticles? Wow, man! Uh, <coughs> recruiting. <laughs> you should be a physicist. Okay, so. Uh, that's actually one of the uh, experiment, fundamental questions we have. Now, neutrinos uh, actually turns out to be, it could be its own antiparticle, like photon is, or it could have its separate antiparticle. It is allowed to have both. So when neutrino is, uh, anti-neutrino is separate from a neutrino, we call it Dirac particle. When Neutrino, it's its own antiparticle, like photon, then we call it um, Majorana particle, okay? Majorana particle. So we just give them that, that, that is the definition of the Majorana nature. And we are doing, this is, this profoundly uh, uh, impacts theory. The ones I show you about uh, this heavy neutral particle, which uh, is responsible for all this uh, universe, uh, creation of matter uh, universe, is, uh, most of the is required to be uh, Majorana particle. The neutrino, that has to be its own antiparticle, okay? So that is, we don't know. We are still doing the experiment. We are spending millions of dollars to figure out whether neutrino is its own antiparticle or it, it is separate. So good question, a fantastic question. You should really, really consider being a physicist. These people will help you. Second one? Excuse me? Do you have a second question? Yes. Uh, about uh, dark matter, we know that um, mass uh, contains energy, right? And does, does dark matter contain dark energy or normal energy? Uh, okay, so that's, that's a great question. Uh, dark matter has a normal energy. It's, we call it dark matter because we don't, dark means we don't know. Okay, so it's, it, we know it, it exists, but we don't know the nature. Uh, as a, as a, we know in an astrophysical way, but 
particle physicists like to actually know what it is, and we don't know what it is. So but that's why, you know, people comes with these names. I mean, for example, uh, particle physics uh, particles where I introduced uh, quarks and those things, and we call it flavor, flavor of quarks. But quarks don't have flavor. We just, you know, try to describe things we use for particular uh, words to do that. And so dark matter just means we don't know. But it has positive energy, not the negative energy. Okay? Yeah. Thank you very much for amazing lecture. And uh, I would like to know that exists some materials or some um, maybe some sphere, some something, some some field, who, uh, which protect us from neutrino, Be because you know uh, we know that uh, neutrino is very per, uh, um, penet uh, penetrated. Yeah. So so is exists something which um, you pro protect some 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 uh, uh, something for to to uh, to. Um, Stop the neutrons. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Unfortunately, no. <laughs> so unfortunately, that's something we just can't do. Um, there is a. However, you don't have any danger of uh, getting killed by neutrinos. Um, the only danger remotely possible is there's a star, big giant red star called the Betelgeuse. That's the closest, biggest stars nearby. And that thing is getting actually bigger and then redder, which means it's about to explode. Um, I think if that one goes, about, goes probably we'll have some substantial neutrino-related uh, uh, radiation. But the neutrinos, just because even though there are so many, they just penetrate everything. You cannot stop them. Also, at the same time, it doesn't harm us. The only time, actually, I have to confess, there's a one uh, accelerator we are considering called a muon collider. And then using that muon collider, we're trying to generate the so-called neutrino beams. In that scheme, when we cooked up whole things together, we found out that it generates a neutrino radiation that is actually harmful. So we cannot build that accelerator. That's one of the reasons why we stopped doing that. Do you know that? That's, a, that's one of the reasons why we stopped in, in that direction. So if we're going to build that kind of accelerator, we have to do it somewhere far in the desert, far away from everyone. And so you have to make it such a way that neutrino will come to the space out, not, not to anybody else. So that, that can, but that is like really, really far uh, start. But you're not, you're not going to be harmed by neutrinos. So, but short answer is that no. There's no way you can stop neutrinos. Any other? I have a question. Con considering that the uh, MION accelerator you just mentioned, if mm. we can, cannot stop uh, neutrinos, how, how can we uh, manipulate them? How can we accelerate them? Ah, well, that's a great question. We don't. <laughs> we don't. So the way we do is the way we generate the, uh, the uh, I didn't have time. I mean, you can imagine, so there's so much things in here. I didn't explain it. But the way we generate the muon neutrino is we shoot, we first accelerate the proton. Proton has charge, we can accelerate it. And then that proton hit tungsten or carbon or any, any heavy um, uh, object, element. And then proton, when it goes through, it has a lot of energy. It hits nucleuses, it generates pions. And then these pions decay to muons. When it decay, pions decay to muon, charged particle, and the neutrino. So now you can see, if I have really, really energetic proton, and proton kicks something, just like, you know, imagine you have a, 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 a billiard ball and things like that. If you have really, really hit something hard, everything goes forward, right? So when I, when I hit the, uh, the target with the proton's very, very high energy, the pions coming out has also all going the same direction. And then pion decays to muon and then muon neutrino also going in the same direction. That's how we uh, make the, all the neutrinos going in, in the direction we want it. But once it's generated, we cannot manipulate them. They just, 
they don't care. It's like bad child. You know, they, you don't, you don't know, parents that says whatever it is, they do not care. They just go. Okay? Don't be like that, though. Okay, in the fairy lutein experiment, uh, it was shown that uh, neutrinos could scatter off uh, heavy nucleus like, uh, I, I don't remember, but uh, could you give us uh, your opinion on that? Yeah, yeah. So, um, when, when that kind of uh, uh, thing is made, what we are forgetting, the same thing with this experiment that we are showing, we are forgetting, as I said, gazillions, gazillions, it's like I can't even uh, put down the number of neutrinos doesn't do anything. So these ones are a few of those neutrinos out of gazillions of them can scatter. So that experiment that saw that, and just like we detect some of them, right? So that's why I said, the, the, we are very, one of the most wasteful, inefficient experiment because we basically throw away everything. We generate them, we just, they just don't do anything. We only uh, uh, observe only a few of them. So that experiment, the Koyan, it's called the Koyan scattering experiment, uh, yes. See that, that kind of, uh, okay? Koyan scattering really means, all it means is that neutrino comes in, interacts with the nu nucleus, and then, and then, um, it, it makes the nucleus uh, interaction, so you can see the interaction because by changing the directions or whatever, but nucleus itself is intact, and that's, we call it the Korean scattering. Yes, but I have a question, but uh, the, 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 the energy spectrum is uh, rather narrow in this sense, in this spectrum. Yes, so yes. Yes. No, I mean that uh, one of those experiments uh, does help in terms of understanding uh, supernova uh, the interactions and things like that. So it could be, those kind of measurement um, uh, usually is, is uh, used to input to the theoretical fine tuning, okay? So, so the, yeah, those are very, very useful experiments. And in fact, we are doing T2K experiment. We're not doing, everybody's doing so-called uh, neutrino oscillation measurement, we're doing a lot of measurement called the cross-section measurement. How much of this uh, neutrino interact with the what and what does it produce? And there are many, many things we do. All of the measurement goes into our theoretical foundation to predict other things. So that's one of them. Yeah. Um, well, the last question maybe. Okay. Yeah, uh, I'll be here. You're, you're welcome to come down and ask further questions uh, after I'm not sure if I missed it during the talk, but you talked about uh, neutrinos being able to change into other neutrinos. Yeah. And that we detect uh, neutrinos coming from, let's say, the surface or from the other uh, side of the Earth. And uh, you said that the ones from the other side uh, of the Earth change so we can detect the, uh, the ratio two yeah. to one, right? Yep. Yeah. And why do they change? Only okay. from that direction? Is it the so distance? They time do that. Or? Yeah, it's a distance. So uh, you are asking natural question because why? Because I didn't spend time to di uh, discuss the theory. Because it's a little bit too much for this audience to go through the whole theory. But that's the fundamental problem is that in, in the end, if you really want to understand, you have to understand the, some background theory, right? So let's see, right here. Right here. So, just for you, this theory says, for electron neutrino turns into uh, muon neutrino probability, is this sine square of theta? This is a mixing between electron and muon neutrino. How much nature has mixed? Okay, between them, it's determined by uh, nature, and delta m square is uh, the mass difference between two different uh, uh, mass eigenstates. L is the distance it traveled. And then E is amount of energy that neutrino has. So it's a little bit complicated formula. So let's say neutrino coming from the sun, and we know how much energy it has, and how much of distance it has traveled. Then we can plot that in, and we can calculate the probability. But it's different from uh, atmosphere neutrino has a different energy, different distance it travels. Okay, so the oscillation does not happen like one point. It is continuous oscillation, continuous probability of changing one to another. All right? So we do the 
the calculations one time when the Earth faces the sun and the other time when it's uh, on the opposite. We don't have to do that because every moment the neutrino doesn't really care uh, the, about the Earth. So in the case of uh, 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 you know sun, what we just know the direction of sun, at night, you know oh, yeah. the, it will come through the Earth, and in the in the daytime you know it right that way, right? And we know the distance, and so we can calculate all of this. Thing. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if there are some more questions, maybe you could ask just after the lecture. But I think at this moment we should thank Professor Jank and also Professor Zagorzewska. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. <laughs> OK, you had a question? Well, we have a small. Oh gift for both of you. Hang on a minute. OK. I think this is the first time I'm getting flour from a man. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you again. And the next lecture will be on April 16th. So everyone is invited to. Thank you.